Okay, so we started last week talking about is church a waste of time? We looked at two of the excuses, uh, and so now we're going to look at the third one. Uh, typically, uh, people will say something along the lines of this. No, not that. That's the sound of a baby screaming. <laughs> typically, people will say something along the lines of this, I'm too busy to go to church. Well, okay, but, and I do understand this, really I do. I've got, you know, full-time job, I've got five kids, we've got all kinds of stuff to do with the state, and I, I, I totally get it. Uh, but uh, the answer to that being that you make time for what's important. If you don't, if you honestly, genuinely do not have time for church, that is more of a symbol, a signal, a warning flag, if you will, that you have mis misplaced priorities that you kind of have to have to be, you know, kind of have to think through. You have to ask yourself, what's really important to me? What uh, what is my life about? What's my purpose? And then you have to uh, reevaluate your schedule. Now, some of the things that you have in your schedule might have to be dropped. Like, for instance, you see people do this. This year, I'm going to read through the Bible. I'm not going to clear anything out of my schedule, but somehow I'm magically going to have time appear where I can... Or you see people do, do this with resolutions. This year, I'm going to get fit. Okay, what time... What are you going to switch in your schedule for working out? Like, it's not going to just suddenly magically appear. You only have 24 hours, and how you order them is really up to you. So if you genuinely do not have time for church... Um, I totally believe that most people do not have time for church. You have to make the time. Um, typically, you want your schedule to go something like this. God should always be the number one thing in your life that you always make time for regardless. So you should always make time for prayer and, and that kind of stuff. Make time to be with God. Second to that is family. You should never, ever, ever but work or ministry over family. Um, it's just one of those things where you know some people are married to their jobs. Uh, some pastors are so busy caring for their church that they forget to care for their family. It's just one of those things that you really have to decide. My family is more important than anything else that's going to happen. And people are not going to like that, and you have to stick with it. Because being a good father and being a good husband, that's that's really important. Um, then after that is uh, ministry or something like that, and then work. Work should always be taken for what it is. It's not your life doesn't revolve around work. The instant you die, your boss will replace you. You're replaceable at work. It's just not that big of a thing. It's not something worth stressing about. Do your best job, but then realize at the end of the day, there'll always be something to stress out about work. So just let it go. Um, when you try and try and develop the skill of turning off, uh, ministry is far more important than than work. I mean, even though it doesn't pay, because you're impacting people's lives. You're helping people to you know find God or to grow or whatever. Um, anyways, um, excessive busyness is not good. Um, a lot of times people don't have time for church because they're just really busy all the time. And see, that's the funny part is we have so many things nowadays to, to save time, right? We have phones, we have fast computers, we have faster cars, we have all this different stuff. We are more efficient than humanity has ever been, and yet we don't have any time. Everybody's too busy for everything. Sometimes we're so busy that we can't even get to sleep at night because we're so busy all the time. Like that's that's not great. <laughs> Excessive busyness is not good. Sometimes people think, well, my value is based off of how much I can achieve or accomplish, and that's just not true. Uh, our success doesn't determine how much value we have as a person. Um, Life is more than work, and it has to be something where you don't uh, compromise on something like church or reading the Bible, which you really need for the sake of work. Now, sometimes you're going to be stuck in a situation where you have to work on a Sunday, for instance. And in that kind of situation, there's usually other services throughout the week. Like, for instance, it's pretty uncommon for people to work through every single one of our services. We've got... Two Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, we have got Tuesday in midday and Tuesday at night, Wednesday night, uh, Saturday, uh, uh, Saturday. Um, no, we don't have one on Saturday. Uh, that's something I do with the worship team. Never mind, forget about that. But my point being, even with those three days there, you, you've got a lot of different opportunities um, to to find something. And also nowadays, there's also the the opportunity that you can watch stuff online. And then connect with people in person. Now, this I have to give a warning to because most of everybody who stays home to watch services at their house does really good for about two or three weeks. And then eventually you just get busy. Other things come up. You're like, yeah, I don't have time. I'll watch it later. And then eventually you don't watch it at all. 
See what I mean? And so you really have to watch out for going, trying to go as a digital church. And if by some miracle you are able to achieve that, remember that you still have to put forth the effort to connect with one another. Watching online is fine or whatever, but it doesn't do much to connect you into a, a you know, group. So then there's the other issue that sometimes people say that they're too busy, but the truth is you can't make time or you won't make time. There's a big difference there. Um, sometimes we just like being busy. Like we'll have our kids uh, uh, volunteer for like 17 different things in a week. How about you just ask them, hey, we only have time for you to volunteer for one thing. Maybe one sport instead of five sports. Maybe, <laughs> see what I mean? Like you don't have to do everything. You can just pick and choose. You know, hey, if you don't like it, why? Well, you tried it. Um, sometimes we don't go to church because we'd ra we'd rather do something else that's funner. That's why it says pleasures there. Something that's like, eh, that, that just sounds a lot funner than going to church. Um, sometimes it's because we've uh, been hurt and we're just, eh, I don't really want to make time for that because I've been hurt. And um, so there's that. So what makes people believe in excuse number three? Well, I already talked about um, not distinguishing can't or won't. Uh, too in love with the things that you do for fun, uh, too fixated on your hurts, uh, unwillingness to grow, that's a big thing. Uh, sometimes uh, people say, well, I, I, I'm i like this and I don't want to put forth any effort. I don't want to change. I don't want to be under the pastor's authority. I don't want to, you know, to grow and to do things differently. I've got a good thing going on here. And it can just uh, really be something that prevents you from well, taking the next step. So the fourth excuse, and this is the last excuse we're going to look at. Uh, next week we'll start looking at just a slightly different thing, getting over hurts, but it still relates to this. Um, the last excuse that I want to look at, and remember this is not an exhaustive list. It's just the four top things that I uh, uh, that we're looking at. Um, I've just been hurt, been too hurt too often. And you see people do this a lot. And here's the thing. If you live long enough, you will be hurt. And I know it sucks when people in a church stab you in the back, but remember that everywhere you go, you risk the chance of being stabbed in the back. You, you get in a relationship, you risk the chance of being stabbed in the back. You, uh, your parents get a divorce and your parent gets remarried to somebody. That person could be a total tool. Like, these are things you just can't, you can't plan for. You can't live your life in such a way that nobody will ever hurt you. I have tried. It does not work. <laughs> um, and so with this, give it time. You know, when when you've when you've gone through something that's very traumatic, you have to learn to give it time. You're not going to just wake up one day and be fine. It's going to be continual. You're going to have to deal deal with it. You're going to have to walk through it. It's going to take some time. So do give it time, but know when it's time to deal with it, because sometimes what we do is we kind of just delay. You know what I mean? Like it kind of drag it out like we should be dealing with this and instead we decided to kind of just <laughs> ignore it and hope that it goes away <laughs> and hurt never just disappears from your heart it's not like oh that's okay and then another thing that we think is we think if something good happens it'll outweigh the pain that i feel no that's not how it works either the pain it's a pain but you got to deal with the pain that's just how it is um and hurt always turns into anger. It's just something that happens. If you show me the people with the biggest uh, anger issues that they can't control their temper, I'll show you a traumatic experience that they went through that left them deeply, deeply scarred. You see, a lot of times people with anger issues are people who lived in a household where there was divorce. It's some divorce is something where it, it does something in the child's psyche where they just it's it's hard to deal with that. You know what I mean? And you don't you don't know where to take the, all these feelings. You don't know what you're supposed to feel or how to stop feeling. And you just you don't know what to do with that. And um, so, anyways, that's one of the big big things why I always tell why I always tell parents don't make your kids the center of your house. Make them a part of the family unit because if the kids leave the house, which they will when they turn 18 or thereabouts, you still have a marriage. But what happens when a marriage ends? Well. The kids are left with all this all this damage that they didn't ask for. They didn't ask to be born into a broken home. Colossians 3.13. There it is. Colossians 3.13. 
Um, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And uh, that's a hard thing to live with, but it definitely is a part of being Christian. And uh, you cannot possibly claim to be a Christian and then decide that you have the right to not forgive people. And Matthew 18:15 says, "If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, um, if he listen, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother." And it's at this point that some things happen. Number one, if he didn't really do anything wrong, but you just took offense. You're going to feel real stupid, and you're not going to go and talk to them about it. See what I mean? So right there is your first test, if it's actually a sin versus if you just got your feelings hurt. And uh, the thing with this is that bitter hearts affect everything you do and say. If you honestly think that you can just avoid church and that will fix the problem, you're, you're wrong. That bitterness and that hurt that you experience in a church... It has to be dealt with. If it's left, it will affect everything else you do and say. It will affect your future relationships. It will affect uh, any other group or church that you go to. It will affect everything. If you do not forgive, you won't be forgiven, not just by God but also by people. People are not really willing to forgive people who are kind of bitter and mean. Uh, if, on the other, uh, if on the other hand you're someone who always is trying to you know, forgive people and, and make things um, – make things better, be a peacemaker, then people kind of pick up on that and they say, hey, this is a really nice person. I do want to forgive them. Um, it's like, for instance, if you're married and you treat your wife like crap and then you say, oh, I'm sorry. Well, eventually she's going to say, no, you're not, and she's going to get real tired of that crap. Women have a high pain tolerance emotional, emotionally. So they'll, they'll usually stick, stick out a, a situation even when they're not loved just because women are just amazing creatures. Men, on the other hand, they just... They just they, – they get tired of crap surprisingly fast, like surprisingly fast. Like uh, let's say the wife one time doesn't – I don't know, leaves her shoes in the middle of the floor or something like that. A man will just go freaking crazy. A woman will like endure it for year after year after year until finally she just kind of snaps and she's like, you want to put your shoes up? But a man on the other hand, like the first week of the marriage, he's like, I'm getting a divorce. <laughs> Um, but then also, people will treat you differently if you don't forgive. There's just something that kind of emanates from you. Uh, if you were a New Ager or a mystic, you would say, that dude's got some serious bad energy. But <laughs> it's kind of the idea of the, um, it's the law of attraction that Chuck was making fun of a couple weeks ago. But with that being said, when you have a negative mindset, you always see the negative. That's not the law of attraction. That's just what your focus is on. And the same is kind of true for how you act. When you're a druggie, how is it that you always just stumble upon druggies? When you're a nasty, bitter person, ever notice how you surround yourself with nasty, bitter people? You find people who agree with your nasty little attitude, and then you, oh, well, these are my friends. And it's like, no, they're not friends. They're helping you milk a bad attitude instead of trying to help you grow and learn and change. That's not a friend. So people will treat you differently. Um, oh, you just, you're just not a very fun person to be around. It's like, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, you will carry it with you. You'll never heal as long as you're as long as you're not willing to address the the problem. You're you're not gonna heal. Did it go? There we go. Uh, so how do you get over it when you're just over it? Like I'm over it. I don't even want to try. Just want to move on. How do you get over it when you're at that point? It's easy to get over it when you actually care. But how do you get over it when like you just you're you're past the point of care? Like you have. No more cares left. A complete apathy. Your depression and anxiety has pushed you to a point where you're just like, eh, whatever. Well, first off, pray, and I mean a lot. And I mean really talk with God. I'm not talking about just going through the... I mean really, genuinely, pray. Like, <laughs> it's a conversation with you and God. You know, you take your hurts to him. He's not, it's not like he's going to be like, that's how you felt? I had no idea. Well, I'm going to be real honest. I have no idea what to do here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's, ask, let's ask Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what do you think? We should, you know, it's not like that. And uh, sometimes we have this idea that God is like that, but he's just not. So pray a lot. Second, read your Bible and fast. Um, fasting is something that helps you to kind of clear your mind, and it helps you to kind of um, reevaluate things. Um, it can be a really valuable time. Um, the first couple days suck because you're like, that's all you can think of is the thing. But after that, you're like, okay, I got this. Um, and then reading your Bible is just, the, I think it was Scott Wilson did this study 
where uh, of, I think it was 600,000 Christians, and they found that if you go to churches one time a week, but you read any less than four times a week, that uh, you won't feel a difference. But if you read any more than four times a week, four different days, that you start to start to notice a different uh, in your thinking and, and stuff like that. So uh, it's something where it does take time. And it's not a quick, easy fix, but it is definitely there. Try and move past your feelings and thoughts. What we do is we allow our, our feelings to kind of have full reign in our life. I don't feel like trying. I don't feel like forgiving. I don't feel like it doesn't really matter what you feel. It matters what you do that's important. Oftentimes, you're not going to feel like uh, you know being a Christian. I don't want to forgive that person. But once again, life isn't about what you feel and what you don't feel. If you've been married, you know you don't always feel like loving the other person. Uh, uh, you don't always feel like uh, going to work. I mean, it, to pick, take or pick anything in life, you're not always going to feel like doing it. But uh, it's not. it doesn't matter what you feel like doing. It matters what you actually do. So then also try and move past your thoughts. See, oftentimes our thoughts will kind of become like a prison cell, and we'll just kind of run over them over and over again. It, it gets to a point where you have to clear your mind or just choose not to think about it or purposely think about something else or purposely approach your thoughts and correct them like for instance uh nobody loves me or something well actually that's not true that's just me trying to feel sorry for myself see what i mean where you have to and one of those things typically will well it'll take time let's just say that um talking it out will only make it worse for you and them if you try and take your gripes to other people and tell them about how you've been wronged this is what we do i need to vent well the problem with venting oh there's many problems with venting first off venting doesn't really actually do anything to to correct the situation it just replays it over and over again next it gives the other person a bad attitude towards whoever you're talking about uh, or it uh, encourages their bad attitude <laughs> which chances are that's the way it is because we surround ourselves with people who think like us yeah i was just saying that in the proverbs it says that uh, uh fool vents all his feelings for a while by his that is very true. A fool gives full vent to his wrath. Yes, <laughs> yes I, I was actually thinking about that the other day. Um, uh, but yeah, talking it out usually only makes things worse. Um, uh, so how do you get rid of this built-up energy? Well, one thing I want to say, and I, I do, I do want to say this, is um, find an exercise that you like. It can be anything, really. It's something that just gets out energy, is all. Um, I like biking, specifically road biking. It's 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 my bread and butter. Uh, sometimes I take bread and butter sandwiches with me. Just kidding. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I really like doing that. It helps me get rid of energy. It helps me clear my mind. So it's something that you just find something that works for you. Um, but then there's also the thing that you have to come to a point of wanting to change you have to you have to want to move on now i know that, that sounds very easy but sometimes we well i just can't get over this well because you don't really want to like you you're first off anger gives us it gives us kind of a surge you know what i mean like when we feel angry something yeah like a rush we're like yes oh i hate them <laughs> you know what i mean it, just, it makes us feel good you know and uh, it feels so good to you know to, to treat people like crap yeah, yeah. You go driving down the road and you're like, ah, I'll cut them off too. <laughs> ah, them too. <laughs> and uh, but you have to come to a place of saying, you know what, I don't, I don't want to be like this. Uh, I want to move on. I want to heal. I want to grow. Um, I, and I want what's best for them. When you can get to that point, that's when you kind of start turning a corner. Um, do you genuinely want to make peace, or do you want to feel sorry for yourself? Do you want to make peace, or do you want everybody to know that you were the one who was right and everybody else was wrong? Do you want to make peace? or See what I mean? Like You always have to come to this decision. And then there's this little thing that I, that I do, and I think it's very helpful. Release them for the wrong that they've done. Now, how do you do that? Well, how I have done it in the past is where I go to prayer and I say, God, I just I forgive them. I let it go. And then I, and then I kind of – sometimes I, I, I do this with my hands just to kind of help me to picture what I'm doing. I just go like this. Any wrong that they've done towards me, I have no right to hold on to. I'm just letting it go. So if you don't hold them accountable for anything, I don't hold them accountable for anything. If you do, it's up to you. See what I mean? Just kind of releasing them. And it's, it's something where you have to verb, where you have to verbalize it to yourself. Honestly, I think because something happens in your head 
Wait, so obviously you don't want to be doing this in front of people because they'll think that you're a whack job. <laughs> but uh, so just get alone somewhere and just kind of um, just kind of talk to God and say, you know what? I just I, it, it I let I, I'm letting it go. It's, it's it's out of my hands now, and it does something I think. Um, give it another chance now. I want to give some give some caution here. When somebody has broken trust, do not just give, go out and give them trust again. You see, you see, women do this a lot in abusive relationships. A guy abuses her. Oh, but he said that he's sorry. <sighs> trust has to be earned. It has to be earned. It has to be earned. You can't just give trust to somebody just because you like them or they have a nice smile. It has to be earned. And if somebody does something like hit you, they've crossed a line that they can never come back from. Chances are if they've hit you once, they will hit you again. The best thing to do is just move on. You don't need them. You don't have to have them. Just let it go. So you made a bad choice in a, in, in, in a relationship. Who cares? Everybody makes mistakes. Like You can't live a, a faultless existence. Move on. I'm like it's it's okay. We're, we're, we'll we'll make it through this together. Uh, the problem is that a lot of times people have a hard time getting out. And for that, I will say 90% of the problem is fear. 90% of the problem is fear. If you have an opportunity to leave, always take it and get somewhere where you'll be safe. And then um, one thing that can help is taking self-defense classes. Now this isn't always a thing. Um, I actually have a friend who took uh, a lot of self-defense classes, and uh, she came out of a, a, a restaurant, and uh, she is some dude tried to tried to rape her, so he so she hit him in I believe it was the nuts, and I think she even had a taser, and this dude was still going at. He was drunk though, and I don't know, maybe that had something to do with it. And uh, the only way she was able to get free of this guy was that somebody else came out of the restaurant and uh, stopped anything from happening. But how gross is that, man? She was almost raped in a parking lot. Like, jeez. Golly, back in my day, we took women out to the... No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. It's a joke. I'm joking. But uh, anyways, uh, so when I say give it another chance, I mean this. Give church another chance. Give being open with people another chance. Yes, some people will take advantage of you. Some people will stomp on the flower that is your heart. But that doesn't mean that everyone will. There will be some people who do care. So give relationships another try. And I'm not just talking about dating. I'm talking about being real with people you know there's just something wonderful about somebody who knows you and still accepts you you know it's just it's it's something that's good now obviously you shouldn't show your heart to the world that's just asking for a problem uh you should probably keep your thoughts to yourself instead of venting them on like facebook for instance uh, that's really something for you and a close friend not really something for the world uh, people will make fun of you they will uh not really treat you with respect they won't care uh, make sure that you give your heart to people who actually care for it. And even then, you're going to find some people will still stop it. So it's something that you just kind of have to be vulnerable, I guess. Um, so, you know, give, give it another chance. Um, but then there's another, there's another thing. So we know that feelings determine our actions, right? We don't, like, for instance, when you're depressed, you don't feel like going out. So you don't, right? I mean, feelings determine your actions. But the flip side of that is that actions also determine your feelings. In other words, I'm not I'm feeling depressed, so I don't want to go outside. So I go outside and I feel less depressed. See what I mean? The the same as depression causes you impresses you to act a certain way, so your actions can kind of pressure your depression. Now I'm not gonna say you're gonna get suddenly magically you're no longer gonna have a problem with like depression or anxiety or whatever, just because you decided to pick yourself up and power through. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying that just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean you have to cave. So with that being said, if we're talking about getting over bad feelings with a church, if you wait till you feel like getting over it, you won't get over it. But if you get up and do something about it, even when you don't feel like it, eventually feelings will fall. Like for instance, you see the same thing happen with ministry. I don't feel like getting involved with ministry, so you do it anyways, and eventually you care, right? It's one of those things. Uh, don't replay it over and over again, the harm that has been suffered. Don't don't just keep replaying it over and over again. It happened. It's in the past. I know that it sucks. You have to deal with it. Absolutely, you have to deal with it. You have to go through the grieving process. But replaying it over and over in your head does nothing to help you to heal. It just keeps it fresh in your mind. And then you start inventing things to add to the offense too. Like, ah, they did this. 
And I think they did it just to piss me off. And, and, I think not only were they trying to piss me off, but I bet you they wrote a blog post about it and made it where I can't see it. And, I bet you they shared it with their golf club. See what I mean? And it's like, okay, all right, hold on. Wind it back in. <laughs> you don't have to keep making it bigger and bigger, and then eventually it's so large, it's larger than life. Um, control your thinking. This is something that requires a lot of thought. And a lot of times people say, I just can't stop thinking about it because you haven't practiced. Controlling your thinking is something that takes time. It takes a lot of time and effort and energy. Um, so control your thinking. Uh, you don't want to just keep thinking about how those dirty rotten scoundrels, those dirty rats. And then the last thing, uh, remember the good of it too, not just the bad. Like for instance, if you remember uh, somebody who um, really screwed you over, right? They just really ruined your life. Chances are there was a good part of the of the friendship or something good that came out of it. It might be hard to find the good, but it's there if you look hard enough. Anything. I mean, if you, I just finished a book called Robinson Crusoe, and that's basically the premise of the entire book: is there's always good and there's always bad, and you have to you have to sometimes struggle to find the good, but it's there if you look. Um, but anyways, um, so remember the good that that came from the friendship, not just the bad from it. Um, and that's kind of where we're going to stop now. Uh, now we'll finish up this next week, uh, and then in two weeks we're going to look, be looking at um, a video by a pastor named Mike Winger. Mike Winger. Um, and then in um, the next series we're going to be looking at is talking about the will of God, how to find the will of God, what is the will of God, uh, specifically as it relates to things like dating and uh, a job and those kinds of things. Uh, very important stuff. You hear people talking about this all the time. I'm, I'm trying to find the will of God. I'm trying to find God's direction. I'm, yeah, all this different stuff. So good stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we get to it. Um, any questions before I stop? No, I, I just um, I have the whole thing about replaying situations over and over in your head. Mm -hmm. That's something that I can relate to. Um, I think we all can, buddy. Don't feel bad. <laughs> so often. No. I, I tend to do that. Especially if there's a part in the past that you maybe really liked or really didn't like, it's easy to replay that over and over again where it, you know, affects everything you do. I didn't mean to cut you off if you were going to say something. No, no, no. That, okay.